Here we go. All right, Hello. welcome back from our very short little uh, break there. And uh, this is the part of the class where I will actually start painting. So I thank you guys for all your patience for listening to me go on and on. And uh, that, I think that's really fun to look at other artists and how they approach the different issues and different challenges of painting the sky and clouds. And so now we get to design our own problems and we get to uh, figure out our own ways out of said problems. Um, and like I said, there's no right answer. There's no wrong answer. And, you know, if I ever paint a painting again, like I'm going to do with the calla lilies, it's going to be very different because um, I'm just going to set up slightly different issues. And there's always so many different ways to solve any of them. So let's you know, switch over to the, there we go. So this is uh, camera number two in the studio. This is the, um, the, the easel. We have a very large Hughes easel here, which is really nice because we can just, uh, it's very easy to move around. Um, I love this easel. This is a, another palette. So down below, I'm just gonna step it back so we can kind of see what we're looking at here. And this is just so you have a reference point of everything. So I was just sitting right here. Um, that's the very messy office. Um, dual monitors, you can probably see both of them, I think. And then right beside that, I have um, a workbench. I've got uh, one of those cushioned uh, floor mats. This is a Husky uh, toolbox that I had glass cut to fit the top. I also built a secondary sh uh, shelf over to the left there, which I can um, take, it has hinges so I can fold it down if I want. I was gonna put a second one over there, but um, it got too crowded in my studio. Um, and then I got tempered glass cut on top. I paint the tempered glass just like this. I put a neutral gray on my palettes um, as a general rule and sometimes will, um, uh, tone my canvases the same neutral gray and the reason is or a similar neutral gray um, the reason is is because then when I'm mixing colors on here they're already relating to this we've all had the experience when we are mixing our colors or our values that they look so right on the palette but once you get up to the uh, you actually put them on your painting they're just so different right um, so anyways, that's one way I try to alleviate it. Um, I'm just going to be using some super inexpensive, cheap Blick and Art District uh, acrylic paints. Um, and then when doing sky paintings and cloud paintings, I very, if you want to have soft edges, because acrylics are famous for wanting to dry very quickly and make very crisp, hard edges, if you want to get away from that, um, from time to time, having a little mister is a great tool for uh, being able to soften edges. Also, I use it to spray on my paints and my brush so that my paints stay wet longer on the palette. So I don't know what these cost, six to nine dollars. Um, I found mine in the gardening section of uh, on Amazon. Um, so I guess they're great for plants. And in fact, my plants in my studio have been very thankful that I have this. My daughter loves to mist the plants up here. Um, so anyways, mister. Um, I could just attach this to here because I'm not using oil paints. When I go to the color, I'll be putting my oil paints on here so you'll be able to see the, the mixing as well. That's why I like having a horizontal or an upright palette so that you guys can watch as I'm mixing with um, all on the same screen. So let me get a little piece of tape so I can take that up. And blue tape. I buy this stuff by the truckload. I paint the edges of my panels with blue tape. You can see that. Um, oftentimes that way uh, keeps the edges nice and clean and I can just remove the tape um, at the end of the painting.
Michael, are you finding in the art galleries or like, I know preferences change. Um, and are you finding that people like the black edges mostly? Or I know sometimes I've seen white and sometimes I've seen the painting wrap around. Um, I do know a lot of artists like to do the wrap around painting. I just, yeah, with oil paints, that'd be so hard because I don't know how I would even hold the edges. Um, I just go with black because I use black frames. So, um, but I, I have done some where I use gold paint. Um, I just, to keep it harmonious between them and to keep them feeling like they belong together, I've just gone to black. And for those of you who um, have been in my class, I make up my own black paint. Um, I make a big tub of it each time. And it's a combination of black gesso, black acrylic, and then the most important ingredient is a gloss gel because, um, and that makes the paint a little bit stronger and a little more protected. All right, so are you guys able to see that reference very well? I'm gonna zoom yep. just a touch. All right, hopefully that works all right. And hopefully my arm won't get in the way too much as I'm painting um, and change the focus. But what I want to look at is I want to look at these clouds as three-dimensional objects at this point. Okay, so if you guys have done much painting, I bet that you have painted um, three-dimensional squares or apples right? You've painted still lives of apples. Um, you can think of it much the same. Um, depending on the shape of the cloud, I will think of a sphere or a cube, right? Um, if I'm thinking of a cube, so I'm just going to pretend I'm painting this cloud up here, right? And it kind of comes off this side. Let's see, it's not dark enough. Kind of comes off the side here, has a base to it, and it wants to kind of come up. So I'm taking this very uh, kind of complicated shape, and it has a base to it. Actually, it's even higher up. All right, can you kind of see that as a cube in space a little bit? Let's put another one over here. So then there's another one attached to it. And I'm just gonna think, I don't expect you guys to paint cubes in space on your paintings, but it's kind of how I think about it. I think, okay, you know, if it was a ge geometric shape, um, it's got another one kind of floating here. This one's a little more straight on. I'm seeing a little less of the underside of it. But I'm still seeing some of the underside. Thinking about what's my light source and my shadow. The shadows are underneath the bottoms of these. Is that kind of making sense, you guys, a little bit? Of thinking of these as geometric shapes? Um, more realistically, I would think of them as more, I'm gonna go down to this one and treat it more as a sphere or kind of a ovally sphere in space. So, right, that already feels more cloud-like to me just by the fact of not, because clouds don't have hard, crisp edges, but I'm thinking of it as a shape. And so I've also got the underside of this
Okay, this one I'm going to treat a little more amorphous. So it's still kind of, it's going to be a little more cloud shaped from the beginning, right? But I'm still thinking of it as a shape, like a hard, crisp shape, kind of a, I don't know what that is, a turtle or something, um, that I could, you know, theoretically, if it was a puzzle piece, right, I could just pick off the puzzle. Um, but it still has a top, a middle in this instance, and a bottom, a base. So I'm going to put the base in. And let's go ahead and get a top on it where it's catching the light. Maybe I'll come back in and add the top to most of them. And a mid value. So there's the most amorphous shape. Like, can you see that it has a light, a mid, and a shadow? And it's just a shape. I don't know what shape you would like to call that, turtle or whatever. Let's go back to our boxes. Our boxes are catching the light up on top. And again, this is more done in my head than I would ever do on the surface when I was out, like if I'm out plein air painting and trying to capture the clouds, I would more just be looking at it and go, okay, it's kind of box-like or it's more oval shape or whatever else, but it's got just like an actual shape. You know, if I was doing a still life, it has a top and a bottom and changing of sides. But what happens with clouds, right, is that instead of this hard edge between the shadow underneath and the top, because it's soft and rounded, you get these transitions. Right? It's more rounded, just like a sphere would be. Being lazy, not wiping my brush. So can you see how that right there kind of mimics this a little bit? Values, yeah, different right. values. Breaking down and then I can soften that transition. All right, let's turn this into a cloud. probably too dark of a dark underneath is what I'm seeing, but just to show you. I love the acrylics because they're so fast. I can just layer and layer and layer so quickly. Um, they're fun for playing with and kind of speeding up some of the processes. So I'm still retaining that structural underpinning that I had put on there by thinking about what is the shape that I'm looking at.
All right, you see how the structure is kind of, I mean, the, the values and the shift has kind of stayed the same, but by figuring out kind of the box-like or sphere-like structure here, um, and I can do the same again with the, even though I put in a box, we can make it very quickly cloud-like. We'll just retain that shape. Well, not retain that shape, retain that underlying structure. Am I making sense, you guys? It's a little bit interesting to try to discuss yes. turning a square yes. into a cloud. Looks good to me. I think so too. Mm -hmm. so we Kind of looks like a cupcake now. Delicious one. Delicious creamy cupcake. So within each of those strong values, I can then begin to break those up a little more, but I still probably want to kind of retain like this little white strip that I put down here. It's probably breaking up this dark area down a little much, so I might just want to darken that a touch more. Um, so I try to keep my value families kind of related, otherwise your clouds can become very busy um, unnecessarily. Get rid of some of these darks, they're not need, probably needed. So there, the, uh, so taking the shape, finding the form, and then creating the transitions within. Um, yeah, I almost want to just see. See if it'll let me paint on top this quickly so we can kind of show how I would actually much more realistically approach it if I were painting on location or trying to do this. Because I wouldn't you know, start off with a bunch of squares. And I wouldn't start off with a bunch of um, a bunch of circles when I'm painting a sky, but I would start off with kind of the structural elements that I'm seeing. I would just start off with them being more amorphous, and this probably is going to be too wet. So what I may do is jump over to the color. What time is up? Nope, we need to jump over to color anyways. So. Did that make sense, you guys? Figuring out, I want one painting of structural clouds mm -hmm. and one painting of clouds being described by color. And you can do your structural clouds in black and white if you would like. Um, I will probably just reuse this panel next week. All right. So very quickly, I'm going to lay out some colors on my palette. Switch painting surfaces. And I will let you guys, or I'll have you guys look at this one. So this is one, um, a painting I've been working on um, for a little while. And it kind of, oh, can't see it, describes Kind of all the different elements in the sky that I've been talking about. It has some structural clouds, it has some very wispy clouds. Gorgeous. It has lost edges, yes. round edges, and then it's going to also be described through color. So it's not like cloud painting is one thing or the other, right? A lot of times within the sky, we're going to be using all of these different elements.
When transferring over from acrylics to oils, I want to make sure I get all of my acrylic stuff away. I don't want to accidentally use brushes that have acrylic paint. I don't want to accidentally dip my oils into the water bowl or anything like that. So very quickly in between, I just make sure that I get everything to a table next door or put them away. Um, nothing worse than when you get your oils and your acrylics mixed with each other when the acrylics are still wet. It just turns into a gummy, gummy mess. Um, makes it really hard to clean because they want to clean with different materials. All right. Um, I'm just going to quickly use my typical split primary palette, um, which we go over a lot in the color painting class. Um, for me, Um, I use um, a white, which is titanium white, pretty much always. And then I use a cool greenish yellow, which is often cadmium lemon, cadmium yellow light. Um, this one is called cadmium free yellow light. So I'm excited to try that. I'd love to not have cadmium paints in my studio. So this is a new one by Utrecht, new as in the last couple of years. Um, so it's an actual opaque light yellow. Um, for my yellow that leans towards orange, and I'll describe all this a little bit slower here in a second, um, I'm using an Indian yellow. I used to use cadmium yellow medium or something like that uh, most of the time, but I've just kind of slowly switched over to using Indian yellow as my warmer orange or yellow. Um, using a cadmium free red light, which I'm excited again, but um, Utrecht, so we'll see how that works. I use a warm red, a uh, red that leans towards orange. Can be any number of colors. And then my red that leans towards purple is quinacridone red. If you, don't want to write all this down. I have the notes written. If you just go to my website underneath um, workshops and classes, there's a whole list written out in all, all its gory detail there. Um, I love quinacridone red. Um, it's basically what I would use instead of alizarin. Um, it just has, it does more, has a bigger color range than alizarin crimson. Um, ultramarine blue. It's a blue that leans towards purple. So this is my red that leans towards purple, my blue that leans towards purple, and manganese blue hue, which is my blue that leans towards green. So a lot of artists talk about warm and cool colors in each um, thing. I just like to say that I've got one yellow that leans towards green, kind of coming back around the color wheel, one yellow that leans towards orange, one red that leans towards orange, one red that leans towards purple, one blue that leans towards purple, and one blue that leads towards green. So I could lay these out in more of a color wheel format, um, and it would totally make sense. This, out of all these color wheels, it's this one here. So uh, the two yellows, two reds, and two blues, and how they would go together in a color wheel. And I can make a huge amount of colors, not every color, but a huge amount of colors, you know, in the millions <laughs> um, with that color palette. Um, this is if I, this is a color palette with only one red, one yellow, one blue. This is the Zorn palette with the black, the yellow ochre and a warm red. And then the CMYK palette as best as I've figured out how to kind of match it. So I love playing with color, color wheels, experimenting. Um, but this is kind of my go-to pretty much all the time color palette. Sometimes I'll add a little bit of Payne's gray or some kind of a black. Um, and sometimes I have like a burnt umber or an earth red, some kind of a brownish color. Um, and so sometimes there's just other guest colors. I, I pretty much, I own hundreds of tubes of paint, just like all of you guys go into the art store and get suckered into whatever beautiful color I see. But uh, this is my most common all around palette. And I feel like I can do the most, the most damage with the least amount of colors with this palette. Um, I'm not saying it's even the best palette. It's just the one that I'm very used to, the one I enjoy working with. 
And, um, oh, I forgot to show you this. So um, in my um, toolbox here, the drawers are filled with different things. So the top tool one is just filled with way too many paintbrushes. And then underneath that, I've got like this drawer is all yellows. Oh, no, sorry, whites and grays, yellows, um, reds, blues, browns, blacks. And then underneath that is um, painting t-shirts and towels and uh, cleaning supplies and gloves, which I should be wearing. Um, so anyways, I try to keep everything right at hand. Um, very much easier to uh, use. And I also have my paint thinner here. I use Gamblin's Gamsol. And then in this one is um, linseed oil that I can use if I want to make my mix it with my paints a little bit to slow the drying time even down further or make the paint a little bit slicker. But primarily, I just use this for cleaning my brushes um, and, or to let my paintings rest. I'll let them sit in there after I've wiped them down once. I also have my um, Razor blades here for scraping and cleaning my glass palettes. Any questions about that? Uh, where'd you get the razor blades? Uh, almost uh, at Home Depot. At the handle too? Yeah. yeah, and they sell these really long razor blades. Yeah, it's for uh, gla uh, cleaning glass for painters. Oh, okay. They buy it in the painting section. Yeah, and then I just buy packs and packs of these razor blades. You can also buy them on Amazon. But yeah, for a great big, huge um, painting surface, which I really like having a big mixing area. Like this is actually, you know, really big for most people. But um, is that screen looking really dark for you guys? It is pretty dark. All right, I may have to shift something. It's interesting because I actually even have extra lights set up on it. Um, but I put it on auto detect um, for Zoom. So maybe it's overly darkening it. Let me just switch that real quick. Sorry, guys. Probably the white. Oops, no, no, turn off. Do this. That was better for a second. Yeah. Think how's that look? Better. Yes. Looks good. All right. First time a computer's ever let me down. Just kidding. All right. Cool. I'm also going to this. All right. So there, hopefully, it should stay on my on my screen when um, when we're talking just in case it was going over. So in the upper right hand corner of your screen, there is a view where you can change how you see the scene as well. Typically, if um, I were painting, you know, not with you guys, and this is probably something I should do anyways, um, what I would do is take and look at the scene that I'm painting. This white wants to slide down the scene here. Um, is I would pre-mix. Again, this is kind of my reference. I would pre-mix some of the colors um, that I want. And I'll, I'll do a little bit of that with my palette knife. And I call that mother colors because all the other colors will be related to those colors. Um, and that helps me to make sure that the colors are going to play nicely together and be related. Um, another thing, just almost as important as where's my light source, is where's my horizon line. Um, unless you're being very purposeful, you want a very straight horizon line, especially if it's an ocean. So um, having a T-square is very useful. Um, so just kind of figure out where I want it. I'm going to do mostly sky here. So 
going to lower my horizon line down to probably about the one third. Is that about right? Hey, Michael? Yeah. Um, I had a heck of a time finding a T-square. I went to all the hardware stores and ended up at uh, Joe, uh, Michael's, and that's where I found one. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I, I've had them for so long, I don't even know if I would know where to look for one. That is kind of interesting. Um, so this is my quinacridone red, and it's I barely have any paint on this brush. Um, I like quinacridone red for sketching some of the time, um, probably more of the time than any other color, because when I go in to blend it or you know put other paint over it, for some reason it doesn't go muddy that often. Um, and I don't know if that's true or if I'm just used to doing it or what, but I'm going to draw in a couple big shapes. I'm going to put a wave, kind of a surf kind of coming in here and have another little wave just for interest there. And it's probably pretty hard to see, isn't it? I can see it. Okay. Um, and I, I, I'm putting the paint on, but I'm wiping most of it off because I just don't want very much paint. I'm just putting down some notes for myself. That's all. So my cloud above the horizon line, it's kind of going to come across here. Um, it also kind of comes back down along the horizon line here. So this will be my kind of bright spot cloud. I'm not going to follow exactly the reference that I'm seeing. Um, something like that. And it's going to kind of come across up here. And then my cloud gets quite a lot bigger up top. And so a lot of times when I'm plain air painting, that is about as much as I will give myself. Um, I might say, you know what, the underside is here, maybe put in some lines, uh, motion. And I'm, I really want to play up. Um, if you've been a student of mine for any amount of time, you've heard me say sexy lines. And I'm trying to change that to being elegant lines, elegant shapes. It used to be sexy lines and sexy shapes. Um, so elegant lines. Um, meaning I just want nice flow to it. I want my shapes to be interesting. I want there to be, I like to think of the old cool, you know, back when cars were just really awesome and had nice flow and movement to them. Um, and so I'm just kind of like letting my arms kind of what would make this shape, this thing I'm seeing, but what would make it even just a little bit better? What would make it a little more interesting, possibly? A little more beautiful. All right, so here we go. I've got kind of my big shapes. I've kept it very, very simple, haven't I? It's really one shape, two shapes, three shapes, four shapes, five, six shapes total. Very basic. I like to keep it at about four to five shapes. I like to keep my values, my lights and my darks uh, pretty limited as well. This painting, this reference doesn't really have hardly any dark darks. It's all pretty light. So my values are going to be kind of condensed into the lighter, brighter uh, value key. Um, it's also, when I think about temperature, it's in the warmer temperature key. Some of these colors just want to slide down. That's the only problem with painting on glass that's put up flat. Um, but can you see this great advantage that I can see the colors here in the same light as the painting will be? And so I can just, I can test my colors much quicker. So it's a fun way to paint. I still paint with my great big um, palette down below a lot. So I'm going to go ahead and start. Oh, and then my light source. My Where is my light, right? Rule number one. You only take away the one rule today. And my light is, my sun is going to be right here. So that's going to be my yellowest, warmest colors. Then it kind of goes out to oranges, right? Oranges. And then it kind of goes out to pinks. 
and the light is kind of coming from underneath the clouds and from behind. So I'm thinking about that. Where is the light source? Not only on the image, but in a in respect to the uh, things that are in the painting, where is the light source? It's behind these clouds and underneath, right? Where is it in accordance to the water and the waves? It's above and directly horizontally behind. Okay, important asking yourself that. These clouds are not like the clouds we just painted um, in the other example. They don't have big, strong, hard shapes that are a little thinner, a little wispier, a little more transparent. Um, they don't have really strong, strong shadows. They just, and it's not being done by values as much as it is, it is by temperature and color. We're going from warm, bright light to cooler shadows. Okay. All right, let's try some of this. Let's see if I can mix a nice big batch of very light, but retaining the warmth yellow. Looks pretty good. I think you can get a little bit, a little bit warmer. So I'll mix the Indian yellow, which is the yellow that leans towards orange. Orange on the uh, color palette is what I consider the warmest color. So if people say, you know, what's warmer, red or yellow, because together they make orange. I don't think that they really are one or the other like that. I think it's which one, which one leans more towards orange. So I just want to make sure I'm mixing up enough paint. We don't want to be too stingy with our paint. That's a huge one for us, you know, especially if you're just starting out in paints. I know that oils can be kind of spendy or acrylics even. Um, okay, now I'm going to start going towards orange as I get further away from the uh, sun itself. I paint, my colors will be getting a little bit more dense. A little bit more orange. And then we start to get towards the oranges. So I'll start. I'm not going to need so much of this color. I made a great big pile, so I can pull away a good part of it and mix it to the next color, which is getting more towards the, uh, the pinks and the salmons, which I love. That's one of my favorite colors is the warm pinky salmon colors. I use those a lot in my paintings. Notice that the, I was letting the color get a little dark, so I just add a little white to it, lighten it up. Don't want it to get too cool. Whenever you add white to a color, it gets cooler. So adding a little more yellow. And do the same thing. This pile got pretty big, so I can pull some of that pile aside. And I'm gonna get to my cooler more purpley red. So it's kind of fun seeing these color shifts as I go around and seeing if they relate to each other, if they play nicely together. Trying to keep the values a little bit lighter because of the whole painting is pretty light. Now we're getting away, getting towards our purples.
and I can spend so much time doing color mixing. All right, here's a good example. This purple is getting really quite purple. So I can mix in a little bit of yellow. That's basically mixing from across the color field because I want it to gray down a little bit. So a little bit of yellow all of a sudden just calms that purple down. So, you know, when painting clouds, of course, black and white, because most clouds are just uh, are variations of gray. It seems like it would be the best thing, but I like to mix my own grays most of the time. Um, and by using colors to mix my grays, I'm forced to think a little deeper and you, you automatically don't end up with these kind of dead paintings where it's just black and white and gray. You end up having all these beautiful, beautiful grays. That are so much richer, even when you're really trying to get them to go gray. Any questions kind of about what I'm doing here? I'm curious um, whether it would be just as effective to start with a pile of, for your grays, a neutral gray of the right value and then take pure colors and tint the grays or would that be more dead color I try that like this is literally called gambling's neutral gray right so i could definitely probably do that um i haven't really done that much um i have friends who use the um, chromatic black and will mix a very neutral gray and let that be their guide um and this may be a great way to kind of reduce some of the colors. Um, so I've, you know, I've got the colors, but then I can kind of mute them down by mixing in with this gray. Could be a great way to do it. Um, but a lot of times I'll just kind of mix across the color wheel to neutralize them. Um, sometimes uh, some of my favorite colors are like a vibrant color mixed with a little bit of black and white, a little bit of gray. And it just kind of does this kind of 1960s color palette thing that I just love. Um, but yeah, that definitely could be useful. Let's see what happens when I mix that gray with the blue purpley color. So very, very subtle. I think that could work on some of the areas um, where the tops of the clouds are hard to see. The tops of the clouds where they become very close. Let's use some of this as well for the background. So we've still got the sky color, which is this interesting kind of dull yellow. Mm -hmm. And it's going a little bit green. It's going a lot greenish. Um, with that gray in it. So I would just simply add a touch of red to that. And red should neutralize green. That's oh, an interesting color. It's not going at all where I want it to go, but I sure like it. Hmm. And it's just beautiful, dull green with little swirls of pink in it. Um, let me squeeze out some more white. Just want to give it a clean area to put it down. I've kind of contaminated it. Um, where are you, white? I go through a lot of paint, but not a lot compared to a lot of my friends, but um, that's okay. I would rather use the paint than um, be chasing not enough. I know a lot of you guys really put out tiny, tiny piles of paint. Um, 
which I understand, but it'll make your painting process more fun and more interesting if you use more paint. I wonder if that gray just had a lot of blue in it or something. Yeah, I mean, black usually does. So yeah, that's why I was thinking if I had a little red to it. Anyways, I think it'll be fun. And I think that'll play nicely against these colors. Um, I do want to see what happens when I mix some gray in there. Let's check it out, Jill. What happens? Got my pink, got my gray. I bet you it's going to be awesome. It's gorgeous in the swirl. Um, it's absolutely amazing if I can figure out a way to leave this broken color. I'm going to see if I can zoom in again. Nope, that's as far in as it'll let me zoom. Um, so I'm going to bring the camera in. I love when the paint is swirled and not fully, fully mixed. So you can see the little bit of gray with the pink ridges, and uh, that could be neat. So I will see. That's kind of stuff I want to get better at is leaving some brush strokes with their magical swirl and mix. All right. Um, I think that's about all I need. So. Um, oftentimes I like to start from my darks to my lights. I just want to make sure that the change this, otherwise I can't reach it. Um, so grab a couple brushes. I, I like bigger brushes, especially in the beginning. Reaching into my drawer here. Brushing off kind of a crazy brush here. It's just a long, very long bristle. Um, the bristle's that long. I really like that. It, it adds a lot of nice movement to the brushwork um, called like an Egbert brush. Um, I have a number of these. And so let's just go ahead and start with some of our, our darks and just kind of squish those in. And that will help me give me my structure a little bit. I, and it's not very dark darks, but. Uh, and I also generally will keep my darks a little thinner. So you can kind of see I'm pushing the paint onto the surface um, and letting it. I'm pushing it around anyways, kind of scrubbing it in a little bit. As I get to my lights, a lot of times I hope to be a little more gentle um, with my, uh, how I build it up. And um, it will uh, be thicker. The lights will get thicker as I build those up. This corner a little bit darker here. It's almost one of the darkest spots is up in this top right corner. Besides for under the under the water and right at right at the horizon line. Just add a touch of pink thinner. Will help me move this paint along here.
And I really do treat like my painting is I just kind of build it up slowly. I, I just want it to kind of evolve. I don't really work out an area, finish it. I just I kind of want the painting to, uh, the best thing I can compare it to is the old Polaroid pictures, right? Where they just kind of start to appear in front of you. The shapes start to take form. The values kind of get a, start to appear in front of you. And then, um, and then the details well come. You just kind of got to trust that the details are going to start showing up eventually. So now that I have all these colors, I can kind of adjust them very quickly, kind of on the fly and just say, you know what, this needs to be a little warmer, a little pinker, a little redder, a little yellow, whatever it is. And I'm just constantly asking questions as I'm putting them down. And it's not very easy to answer these questions until I've got good coverage of this surface because everything is related. All the color, it's impossible to read colors until you get the color that's gonna be next to it. So I'm just kind of giving it my best guess and knowing that I can modify as needed I can keep building this painting up. And I definitely want to start thinking about the where are these colors coming down into the water as well. See, I think Hester Berry, the really dynamic person that was, we were looking at their very uh, action-oriented clouds, I think they would definitely add mediums into their paints to make them very fast. These paints have a drag to them. Um, and, you know, I can do some really interesting things with it, but I think to make it really dynamic and really, uh, I would be wanting to put probably a little bit of oil into it or some kind of a something kind of medium, I'm not sure. I'm curious to ask Hester Berry if I ever met him. I'm not afraid to change the shapes and everything as I go. All right, just finished up my paper roll towel, so let me grab another roll of paper towels. Everything is right at hand. I've got a closet full of them right beside me. So, hey, Michael, do you just use shop towels or? Yeah, that's what these are—the blue shop. What? Oh, okay. Yeah, I used to use Viva, but they changed their formulation. I don't like them anymore. Yeah, I've got some of those vivas, and I'm getting little flakes of stuff everywhere. So exactly, yeah, they're very they like leaf cotton everywhere, whatever it is. Yeah. 
So I wanted this to be lighter, but when I added the white, it went to duller. So now I need to add, add touch just a yellow. So there we go, see that just livens it back up. So when you add white, when you're thinking, oh, it just needs to be lighter, well, you gotta be very careful because a lot of times white, you gotta treat white like a color and it wants to cool things down, not only to lighten them, and it also wants to kind of gray them down, almost just like neutralize their, their awesomeness, their intensity of color. So you can see already the, the warmth to the cool is already starting to show up a little bit as I go from the lights to the darks. Fun, fun, fun. Oh, it's so I just makes me makes my heart excited. I don't know when I just put like down the next value or the next color. And it just all of a sudden just opens up a whole nother level of temperature shifts and warmth and uh, it's also nice when a color that you pre-mixed is actually working. <laughs> Not always the case. So even though I've got paint down there, I can still add more paint by just loading up my brush. And then instead of hitting it and hitting it and hitting it, I'm going to hit it once. Once, maybe twice. Any more than that, I'm mixing. So, if, you know, it's happened so often with new painters or, you know, painters in general, I guess where they're just like, I can't make these colors bright. And then I walk over and they'll put it down and it's bright and then they hit it again and then they hit it again and touch it again. And they just keep touching it until it's basically smushed down into the color with the color underneath it. Um, so if you want nice bright colors, you've got to keep a clean brush, keep wiping it in between. Like right now I've got, the, I started off with this very bright color and now that it's starting to pick up some of these purples, I can take it and use it where it's less intense. And just the, now I'm just watching as the gray, as it grays down that color that's on my brush. And I'm taking it around to the areas where I'm guessing that I want less intense paint. have a brush that I can do a little scrubbing with. This brush is too soft, so I want a firmer brush to do the, some of the water area. Let's try this one.
Um, here's another little thing. You can see that I've smushed this paint around and I'm trying to pick up paint, but there's hardly any paint there because it's so thin, I've smushed it all down. So by simply taking a second, grabbing a palette knife, I can just pick it up, put it in a pile, pull out the paint hair that's in there. And now I've got a good load of paint on my brush. With my water, I'm doing a lot of horizontal strokes, just to kind of lay it down, especially back here. And then I might start getting more angular as I get up closer to uh, let it be a little more dynamic. trying to get big fields and I'm, I'm still can come in and add any detail I want like waves and everything else but I want to get kind of this big underlying field of color and I'm still very aware that I just need to get this thing covered so that I can um, begin to judge the colors better. The colors are against each other. So a lot of times I'll feel like the painting or, you know, I get the whole painting covered and a lot of people will be like, oh, I'm almost done. But actually a lot of times that's where it starts to slow down because I'm thinking more, I'm doing a lot more comparison and um, the shifts. And sometimes those shifts can be very subtle depending on how detailed or how perfect I want to make it. Kind of looking for a dull green gray and kind of put underneath there we go. some of this wave here. Maybe bring little hints of that there and maybe a little bit back here. And a lot of times I'm like, oh, the wave, you know, a wave's not a wave if it doesn't have the foam on top need to get to that, but it got to be patient, got to dark to lights, getting everything covered, and just kind of know where those, the foam and the action is going to go, but that foam definitely will help probably get attention. And you'll see that I'm dipping into all three colors, red, yellow, and blue, on almost all my colors, really. Um, I constantly am graying down the colors or browning down the colors. Even though they'll feel very vibrant, they'll be nowhere near as vibrant as these colors directly out of the tube.
And the cool thing is, is I've been adding color to this painting for approximately 15 minutes. I did the pre-mixing, did my little design, but the actual amount of time I've been applying paint is approximately 15 minutes. And you can really see how much has been covered. Getting close to being covered. Isn't that interesting how this white now appears kind of bluish because of all the warm colors next to it? How are you liking that cad yellow um, free? Yeah, I guess I like it quite a lot. And the cad red, cadmium free red is also mixing nice clean colors yeah i would have to say i like it yeah that's nice good job utrecht Trying to see how far up that warm yellow goes before we get to these kind of grayed down yellows that we made. It's important to, if we want to have warm colors, it's important to have cools and grays as well. Otherwise, your warm colors just don't play. They need to have a counterbalance, something to show up against.
even with these great big cut piles of color that I made, I'm still barely making it with enough paint. So always being reminded to mix bigger piles of paint because I still want to go over the tops of a lot of these colors and get in there and finesse them. Michael, when will this uh, recording be available to watch again, and how do we go about doing that? Good question, good question. Um, so I changed the resolution to hopefully record at a slightly higher resolution than typical, so that's, uh, I got a notice that that would take longer to download. But as soon as the class is done, it will start recording, um, downloading, and uh, rasterizing or finalizing its imagery. Um, from there, I then, once that's done, and that's usually a couple hours, then I will uh, download it to my computer, which also takes a while. And there'll be three different videos. Um, and then from there, I will maybe do a tiny bit of editing. I don't usually do much. Um, and I will load it to YouTube. And YouTube is where the, um, where the lessons will live. Um, I don't have to pay for storage there, and they just get to stay up uh, kind of indefinitely. Um, and uh, so you'll get to watch them, you know, for as long as YouTube lets me keep them up, which they've never asked me to take down any that I know of. Um, so YouTube and my goal will be tonight or tomorrow. Great. Will we get a link then uh, to the recording? You will definitely, I'll send out an email. And then also um, the links will live on that Facebook page. I will have a spot um, that will be kind of a highlighted spot where it will always stay at the top of the page um, that will have all of the classes there in order um, there as well. So if you, you know, if you'll have your email, but if you prefer to not um, have to look through all your emails for it. You can find it on, you can find the link on, on Facebook. Thank you. Yeah, hopefully that works out. Everybody's comfortable, I hope, with YouTube. Yep. So there I have it covered. <laughs> You can see there's big dead areas and areas that are definitely going to need, you know, attention as far as some crests on the waves, some action. Um, I can definitely come in and lighten areas, and I can also come around and start to finesse, you know, give better shapes to some of these clouds um, by simply dragging some of the paint across, putting it softly on top, whatever it is, like this cloud, let's say I want to warm it up, I just take my some of my warmer paint, put it on top. <clears throat> some of that warmth below. My son's gonna be there, so. <clears throat> Add some highlights into the water and stuff here. And bring down more of that light down into the water. And so I like having that kind of dark mid ground underneath the water. So I can put the reflections kind of across the top and I'm just barely skimming the paint. And again, I know that it's getting duller as I add, you know, as every stroke I put. So I'm letting that get away from the center because my sun is going to be right there. In fact, let's just go ahead and put it on there as a reminder. Need a nice clean brush. And it's going to be warm but very light. So I use my orangey yellow. Let's see. One right here. There we 
ejemplo. Even without the detail, it's just so beautiful. Yeah, it's fun to paint a color-based painting. You know what I mean? Again, I'm, it's almost abstract, right? Like I haven't had to really, you know, nothing had to be exactly right. Um, so it's more just about trying to create kind of an overall movement and a feel for it that, uh, that I like. And you know the, the the flow, the energy. That's what's so great about clouds is you know, and soft edges up here. You can see where you can't really tell where things are starting, where things are ending. Whereas I want crisper edges down here, where you know the focal area. Um, like watch this. I'll come through and I'm going to soften the top of this cloud and the top of this cloud. Right. Let me just make my brush clean. So to do that. I'm simply, I could either do it by mixing a third color that would kind of go in between the color of the cloud and the color of the sky, or I can simply just pull out most of the paint I, on my brush. And I'm just going to kind of feather that out a little bit just by. So by just softening this, like you can't hardly tell where the cloud starts and the sky starts. All of a sudden, your interest just comes in just a little more. You're not told, like, this cloud right here is too interesting. So I'll just go and soften that edge. Reduce the contrast, soften the edge. Contrast and edge quality is how we control the viewer's eyes to one of the, one of the main ways. So by knowing that, it's just as important to say where to go as where to not go, or at least to where to not spend too much time. Now you can look up here, you know, I want you to look at my whole painting, but I want you to focus in here. And so that's an important thing to remember as you're building your painting is What is my focus? What's the story I want it to tell? What is it about? This one's about the sky. It's about the colors in the sky. Yeah, I, I just, and by varying the grip on my brush and by varying the pressure with which I'm putting the paint down. So really be, be cognizant of that. Be, you know, if I push down hard, what happens? If I barely skim across the surface, what happens? Um, where is one more useful than the other? Okay, if I don't want the colors to mix, I probably wanna hold my brush like a conductor or like a magic wand, right? And I wanna barely touch it. I'm gonna add some clouds kind of over the top right here. Like there's a, like another, little cloud. No, it's too dark. In fact, I'll just go ahead and wipe that off with my paper towel because that color is just too intense of a, of a red up there. It's out of place and it would compete. So I'll just wipe that off with a paper towel, wipe it down so it's not much paint left. All right, um, five minutes left here. So what I'm going to do is try to finesse a couple areas and add a little bit of information down here into the, into the bottom part. So I'm going to treat this like it's sand here. 
So I'm just going to bring in some beautiful reflected color. And what I did was just triple mix, triple dip my brush. So I've got all three of these colors on my brush all at the same time. And I'm just going to lightly drag. Yeah. The color should shift and change as I do it. Clean my brush, do that again. One, two, three. Do a little bit of that again, but just not with the really warm colors. I want to go towards my more yellowy colors. I'm going to bring a little bit of that into the water. Directly down in the sun. See what I've been kissing kind of the tops of some of these waves. There's a lot of little like white areas of the canvas showing. Um, that's one of the reasons I like to tint my canvas. Oftentimes, um, a little, little bit of color or whatever, but it's not a big deal. I can just kind of come through and just kind of touch into each of those areas a little bit. Not a big deal. Um, I just want to mix up. I'm going to take this color. I shouldn't take all of it like I just did. I'm going to mix some white into it and on a thick enough pile that I can pick up some paint or what I could do, I'm just going to use my palette knife and I'm going to skim it and make some waves. So basically I've just loaded, there, there we go, you can see the side view of the palette knife, loaded up that palette knife with quite a bit of paint and let's just not put it on the wrong side of the palette knife, need it on the back and pick it up and drop it. So the tops of my waves are kind of here. Another one a little further back. You make it look so easy. <laughs> Just gotta mess up a lot of paintings, Michelle, and then it gets easier. Just gotta try and be willing to have less than successful, especially with palette knife. Palette knife is like my arch nemesis compared to most of my friends. Most of my friends use them all the time and I hardly ever use them. And it's because my, my percentages are low. Um, one more little happy wave back here. Um, yeah, but I, but I sure do like, I don't like palette knife paintings, but I love palette knife used in paintings. I think when it's all palette knife all the time, it just, it gets this weird kind of repetitive mark. Mm -hmm. Um, but a lot of times I'll take my palette knife and then I will come back through and just adjust some of the edges so you get this kind of combination brush stroke. Hey, Michael, this is Fred. I've, I've got to go, but thanks so much. And 
Yeah, well, thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the class. Um, yeah, the next classes will be a little more streamlined. We won't have all the requisite talking at the beginning, but I appreciate it. And I plan to get that um, the videos out to you guys as soon as possible. And please join Facebook page and uh, introduce yourselves on there. Great. Have a wonderful day. Hopefully you get some sun out there. It's an awesome painting. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All I'm going to do now is just add a little bit of dark underneath the, uh, the wave just to get a little density. And um, so will that take you out of the high key? Yeah, so this will be, um, you know, very little darks, but I, it's quite flat right now, isn't it? So I'm hoping that by adding just a little bit of shadow, that that will come forward just a little bit more. Wow, that really is a nice effect. So you see how all of a sudden it's not so, so, so flat, I hope. The big thing I've learned is you just don't, with waves, you don't want it to be even. Look, we're jumping ahead. You're getting a little bit of a water lesson and reflections and all that, but nice to have a home for our sky to live in. Okay, I think we are gonna call it for today. Um, yeah, I would probably just kind of keep coming through and sculpting out some of the shadow. Well, sculpting all of it and just kind of making sure things make sense. Um, and also I still, like I said, I've got a lot of speckling of white space that I've left. So I just kind of come through and deal with that. Um, yeah, I had a good time. I was exhausting. That was so much information and trying to get so much in. It's funny that how quickly three hours can go. Um, but I appreciate you guys. I appreciate those of you who are um, still here. Um, and I appreciate those of you who had to leave or uh, plan to watch it in re uh, recording as well. Um, but yeah, thank you guys so much. Um, I mean, yeah, that looks all right. Beautiful, Michael. Yeah, gorgeous. Yeah, love it. Just beautiful. Nice and loose, nice and gestural. So you guys got to see um, going from dark to light. And that's, you know, that's just my way of doing it. It's the way that makes sense to me from thin dark to, thick. to light. So how I build up my paints is from dark to light, from thin to thick, meaning thinner paint to thicker paint, and from big shapes to small shapes. Not right that's then. what I'd be doing now is just kind of getting towards my small shapes. Um, and it just seems to be that the paint wants to apply that way better. Um, if I try to put thick, thick paint down and then want to make changes, it is more difficult. Um, if I put down lights and then want to get to the darks, they seem to get chalky and uh, it's harder. To do. Um, and, uh, you know, if you paint small shapes to big shapes, which some people can do, but I think that's more of a different kind of a brain, more of like an autistic kind of a brain can deal with that where things go detail all the way across. Um, and I don't, you know, mean what does that, that mean? positive or negative. Are, just, are autistic people detailed? Autistic. Oh, autistic, um, like autism. Oh, I see. Um, there's just certain kinds of brains that can just look and do detail all the way across. 
Uh, mine doesn't. Mine likes to build up towards the detail in the areas. Um, and, uh, you know, we're all different. We'll all find our ways of working. Um, but I find if I go with detail, what happens is I might fall in love with that detail. And then I find myself protecting that area. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas I find if I go big shapes and then work my way to the detail, then it all comes together together. Comes together together. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds funny. <laughs> uh, any questions, you guys, before we part ways? And uh... In your flyer for uh, this uh, course, you also had mentioned rocks. Are you going to throw a rock or two into the tree thing? I hope so. Uh, yeah, we'll talk about that. I hope um, so. Yeah, so. I, I, I have a hard time with rocks. There, yeah, we will definitely. The big thing, the big difference is going to be in your edge quality, right? You want that mm. transient movement feel of clouds, and you want your clouds to feel aloft and, you know, up there. Whereas your rocks, you want them to feel heavy and grounded and edge quality. So we'll definitely talk about that. Yeah, same thing will be in our trees. Um, you know, you want your trees to feel grounded and solid. If everything's treated the same, which, you know, we've seen lots and lots of paintings like that, right? Where the clouds are painted with the same edge quality as the rocks and the same density of color and shadow. And it just feels awkward. It just doesn't feel natural and it doesn't feel as inviting. You know, it feels like the sky is falling um, or the rocks are floating or whatever. And so, yeah, we will definitely talk about that some. Mm -hmm. um, and even on the final two weeks, you know, where we're working on our assignments, it doesn't oh. mean I won't be teaching. I'll be going over and everything. because we have so much to go over. I can't Do believe. we have no assignments this week? I've mixed up. Oh, this week is two. One, and they can be very quick. You can do them okay. in 10, 15 minutes. I just want you to do one cloud uh, patterning with that okay. where the clouds have structure. Okay. Where they have form. And then one clouds where you're doing it based on color shifts. So you can use exact same references or you can look through and pick whatever you want and feel free to paint from other artists' paintings. Just uh, you know, make sure on the back you write what the name of the painting and the artist is if you can find it and um, don't sell them. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, don't thank you so much. It was fabulous. Oh, it was my pleasure. I'm so glad you joined me again. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to be here for the whole thing. I signed up. Oh, uh, good. It's so great to see everybody come back and um, welcome all the new faces and then some old faces that I haven't seen in a long time. It's great to have them all back. <laughs> and uh, uh, it, that's, it's always so fun for me. The group is always so neat and um, everybody's so nice and shares and uh, helps each other. I love it. I love it. Love it too. You take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well, see you next Wednesday. Love you at OSA tomorrow. Or Bye. Bye. Take care. Take care. Bye. 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 Be well. Take care, everybody. Thank you.